Welcome to LifeLink Church. My name is Sasha, and we are so glad that you're watching today. Before we jump into today's message, we want to invite you to join us in person Sundays at 9 and 11. We'd love to connect with you at one of our Sunday services. Now, grab something to take notes with, and let's get ready to dive in and hear something from God today. Thank you so much for prioritizing being here today. You can always watch the playback, but there's just something about being there in person. How many of you know that's true? So today is going to be an exciting day for you as it is for me too. And I'm really shocked that you came back to the 11 o'clock service, especially if you were here for the 11 o'clock service last week. So as part of what we're celebrating, we celebrate uh, 62 decisions uh, that people made on Easter Sunday. Love that. Life change in every facet is so strategic and significant. And we followed that up last week with 48 people being water baptized. There is a party in heaven over that. So, 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 so good. So it's a season we're celebrating. God's doing great things. And I'm just thrilled to be a part of it myself and glad to know that you're in it as well. So starting a brand new series today. Somebody say new series. And it is a good one. I'm so excited about what I believe God is positioning us to grow into. I can hardly wait. So I'm going to pray and we're going to dive in. And, and I'm going to just believe you're going to listen faster than the first service listened. They listened terribly slow. It was a long one. So let's pray. God, thank you for being so faithful to us. We're excited about who you are. We celebrate this season that we're in because you're so close to us. Today, God, we commit to, to give you an open mind, an open heart a posture of preparation to hear what you have to say, to receive it and let the fruit of transformation grow in our understanding. We thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So I'm starting this new series and you can probably see on the screen what it's all about. Is there any question about what this is gonna be about for the next few weeks? Somebody tell me one word. What do you think the sermon series is gonna be about? Money. <laughs> so... We titled it this way because this is how everybody thinks that the church thinks about money. In fact, let's all just read that out loud together. Ready? Read. The church just wants my money. Now we said it. It's out there. It's not true, but it's out there. So I want to just, uh, I want to hit that right between the eyes and just say what I'm hopeful for you is the same thing I'm hopeful for me, that God would actually work through this particular series, which really is not a money series, it's a vision series about what God is positioning us to do as individuals and as a church ministry to expand who we are as people, as households, and as a church ministry. So we're going to be able to let him expand us for that, for his purpose, and I couldn't be more excited about that. So I wanted to just go ahead and hit that right between the eyes today and then just let everybody off the hook. Because I want to start by looking at a scripture that I think God wants all of us to know when it comes to giving as it relates to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so that we can uncross our arms, unfasten our seatbelts, and just take, get ready to take notes and receive everything that God has for us. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 7, he says, Each one of you must give what you have decided in your heart, not with regret, nor under compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. So the way I always was raised with that understanding is God loves a cheerful giver, so get a grin on your face, get a smile on your face as you give what you don't want to give to the Lord. <laughs> Which couldn't be further from the truth. So God does not want burdened giving. He doesn't, he doesn't want obligatory sense of giving. He wants a, a, a relational context with which we respond to who he is and what he wants to do in us, for us, and through us. So I want to just give you permission, whether you're a guest today or whether you're a regular attender, we are going to be talking about a vision series for this next few weeks. It does involve God stretching us in our understanding of what it means to be prosperous and generous. It does involve finance. But it's not designed to make you feel obligated and pressured to do something that you don't want to do. So here's the bottom line. If you don't want to do it, by all means, don't. Yeah. Got it? Everybody good? Yeah. Because if you don't want to give it, number one, God doesn't want to receive it. And number two, LifeLink doesn't want it either. So now that we just said it, now we can just relax. Turn to touch your neighbor and say, relax. You can smile. All right. 
No, really, honestly, if you're a guest today, you couldn't have picked a better, a better series to come check a church out. Because when you think about it, the way a church deals about money is a deep periscope in to how a church actually operates. So we welcome you to, to join us in the exploration of the scriptures for the next few weeks with no strings attached and get a good feel for what God's doing at LifeLink. And I believe God's going to do something great in you as he's doing something great in all of us on the journey as well, regardless of what you choose to do in response. All right, so uh, this is going to be a three-week series through the rest of the month of April. And basically it's a three-week sermon. It's designed to cast vision, to establish a biblical principle and biblical context, and then uh, invite you for a practical response. So LifeLink is a cards up kind of ministry. So we don't play gotcha and obligation and guilt manipulation with our approach to ministry. We teach what the scripture says clearly and innocently. We invite people to participate. And we just pray that God does the work of heart transformation all along the way. Does that make sense? So having said that, here's what we're going to do. Today, I'm going to spend the next 30 or 40 minutes talking about the biblical context of what this series is going to be about. In short, I'm going to talk about the fact that God is increasing his, his well, really expanding what he wants to do in us so he can increase what he wants to do through us as it relates to his kingdom. So God wants more of his kingdom moving through our life than is happening right now. How many of you would be interested in more of his kingdom moving through your life? Let me put it in some context. So how about this? More people responding to the message of the gospel through your life. How many of you know we live in a time and in an era that people are desperate for some stable hope? The economic outlook, the pressure of election, uh, of an election year, those tensions in the Middle East, just all the things that right now seem to unsettle people with such effectiveness that they're looking for hope and there's nothing filled with more hope than the kingdom of God in real practical ways. So I just believe God wants to say, I want to increase your ability to make yourself available for that. So I'm gonna, you're going to have to expand for my kingdom's sake. I love that. Same thing for miracles. I would love to see more miracles flow through my life. I'm going to have to believe for more of that. Does that make sense? So every part of his kingdom moving through me, it's happening at a certain rate, but God wants to make that rate bigger. That's what I believe he wants to do in us. So I also want to acknowledge that there are some of us in this room today that we're facing circumstances that might make us think, you know, this just isn't a good time. It's not a good time to, for a finance series or a vision series. I'm facing a diagnosis of a, a, a terminal illness or I've got a, a financial collapse that's happening or my family's in disarray or there's just a number of things happening. It's just not a good time, Pastor Dave. And let me just say with a, a genuine shepherd's heart, I feel that. In fact, I'm walking through that. Some of you know this already, but some of you that are relatively new may not know that last summer I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. For those of you that know anything about that, that is not a curable disease. So I'm laboring the rest of my journey under the, at the mandate of divine healing, but the, the diagnosis of a disease that cannot be cured. Does that make sense? So in the journey, God is recalibrating the way I look at his kingdom and look at his life. I fully expect the healing to manifest in my journey. Does that make sense? But I know what it feels like to have, to have been hit between the eyes with a diagnosis. And if that's something that's happened recently to you or a member of your family or a sudden collapse in your e economy or a loss of a job or a relationship that broke or just anything that really feels heavy, I want you to know that God knows exactly how to meet you where you are. And, and listen carefully. Let the season of what he's doing collectively be a part of what he's doing to heal and replace and redeem that situation in your journey too. So what I'm saying is God doesn't just steamroll over the hard parts of our life as if he doesn't care. He knows how to come right into the pain of our journey and say, I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you through this season. And if you'll let me walk you through this process that I'm doing collectively, you'll see how this, what I'm doing collectively, is part of what I want to do to heal that part of who you are too. Does that make sense? So God is not insensitive. He's not callous. 
He is a loving father that knows exactly how to meet us, whether we're on the top of a mountain or the deepest part of a despairing valley. Does that make sense? So as a pastor, I have to just trust that God knows where every person is and say, as I deliver this message with Pastor Shree over the next few weeks, that it's going to have celebratory tones, tones of victory, of faith building and all those kinds of things. But if you're in here and you happen to be in a season of a valley in your life, we're not being insensitive. God actually wants to use this to be part of healing and redeeming where you're at. Everybody got it? Okay. So today, biblical context. Next week is what we're actually, that's the why. Next week we're going to talk about what we're uh, seeing God do. So the vision of what we see God doing for these next several months with what he's challenging us and inviting us to do these next three weeks has to do with expansion of, what, of who we are as a church ministry. So we'll talk more in details about this next week with, with details and figures and all that kind of thing. But bottom line is just like he's saying to our personal life, and our personal individual walk that I want you to expand, he's saying that to our church as well. I want you to expand who you are so I can do more through you. For Gilbert, that means God wants, is challenging us to renovate this particular campus. This campus is 10 years old. It is time to refresh. It's time to re retool and re-equip. We we're limping along in some spots that maybe not be so obvious, but it's just time to reinvest in the campus. It's like a house that's been lived in for a couple decades. It just happens faster for the church because more people live in it. You ever walk into a new home and it just feels fantastic? It's like, oh, I want to live here. Then you walk into your old house. You're thinking, this old shack? Well, when people walk in, we don't want them to have an old shack feeling. Because we don't have an old shack experience, but we don't want our house to look like an old shack house. Does that make sense? So we, want, we believe God's challenging us to re-equip, re to retool and refresh this particular uh, facility as part of expanding our efficacy in this part of the valley. But he's also challenging us to expand by launching a new campus in Queen Creek. Does that make sense? So we've been gunning for this one for a couple years too. But what he's saying is I don't want you to launch a new one and have an old fuddy-duddy too. We want two brand new, highly effective uh, places and facilities to worship in. Does that make sense? So that's more specific about that next week. But today is the, is the why. Next week, next week is the what. And then on the 28th, lots of things happen on the 28th. You don't want to miss the 28th. It's the how. <clears throat> it's the how. So there are several things. We're going to coalesce into uh, a, a, our first giving experience for the Kingdom Builders journey that we're all going to take this next several months. But it also happens to be our anniversary. Is it 18 years? Huh? Yes, the church anniversary. Pastor, Pastor Shri and I have been married a lot longer than 18 years. We have a 30-something-year-old daughter, so just go work the math. And we did it right. <laughs> Pastor Shri's dad did our marriage wed wedding ceremony, and he was so pleased to say that, that we were virgins when we got married. So work the math. Huh? He said it in the actual wedding ceremony. So a bit of awkward feelings there, but, but he, was, he was really excited to be able to say that. Nothing to do with this message. Don't know why stuff like that just falls into the sermon. I, I got to get better at that, but anyway. But it is our 18th anniversary, and we're going to do a lot of fun things on that day in, in addition to the, the commitment giving. Uh, I believe that the team has decided we're going to wear LifeLink apparel that day. We're going to have lots of LifeLink stuff going on that day. It's going to be a big weekend. So celebration all around. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, to that end, I want to go ahead and, and lay our cards up and say exactly what we're going to be doing. So under your seat or near you is one of these cards. If, you could, if you've got the flexibility, can you reach around, under, above, below, pay somebody $5 to get it for you? Whatever it takes, get a hold of one of these. It looks like this. This is uh, our season that we're in. It's, it's God's time for LifeLink Church to multiply. And so here's a summary of what I just talked about on this side. On the back, if you'll turn it over to the back, this is a checklist of areas that typically are part of a lot of people's lives in different ways that we have resources available to us that God may touch our, touch our heart to say, 
I put that in you 15 years ago for this time. I want, I'd like to have you put that back into my kingdom now or any number of things. Again, this is not manipulation. This is just a prompter or a reminder so that as you're praying, you can say, God, is there any of this in my life? Is there any of this in my life? Is there any of that in my life? And only do what he says, but it is a reminder because sometimes we, get it, we have a set it and forget it lifestyle and there may be things in our resource influence that we've not thought about for a while. But it's part, of our, it's part of our palette that we paint from. So I just want to get that in front of you. You can use this for the next few weeks in prayer. On the last week of the month, we'll actually have a different card that we'll be using. But it basically takes the result of this and, and makes it available in a, a commitment card. Does that make sense? And I also want you to know on the 28th, we're passing out a resource book to every person that calls Lifelink home. And that is this. There's a book that was, recent re- uh, that was written and released recently called The Unstorable Blessing. I know a little bit about that book. It is, <laughs> well, God wrote it. He, he used my computer to write it. So, no, actually, we preached a sermon series in November of last year, and, and God just said, I want that in a book. So I took the time to put that into a book. And it's available now. But I'm not asking you to buy the book. LifeLink is going to invest that back into you because it is a resource that's specifically dealing with some of what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to actually take the summer series of life groups, give traditional life groups a break this summer, and do a Wednesday night equipped class for anybody who wants to get serious about being involved in the kingdom of finance. Does that make sense? So I'm super excited about it. But it's, it's a free resource to you. It's all coming out. Uh, on the 28th. So, all right, let me get started in today. The biblical context for this series really comes down to redefining the word prosperity. Now, if you've been around the church for a while, you may have just gotten a quiver in your liver. Because in, ch- in some church circles, the word prosperity has, has really, rightfully so, gotten kind of a bad rap. It's, it's, uh, it's had its, its uh, journey through lots of abuse and misuse. But it's not something that's not biblical. It's just gotten some weird traction on it. Does that make sense? Because of that, many people that are at, at home in church feel uncomfortable about the actual idea of being prosperous. And so what we're going to ask God to do for the next few weeks is say, God, my mindset is yours. I want us to, re- to realize that we are living our mindset. We're living our mindset. And God says, I want to change. In fact, let's just look at this. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, which means to learn something that you don't already know or think something you, a way you don't already think. That's how God wants to change us. He wants us to change us into new people by changing the way we think. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to carefully and pastorally work through this issue today because I believe this issue is one of the spots that darkness has established a stronghold in the very core of the way most Christians think that is actually dark. It's not biblical, but it feels Christian because it looks humble and it looks pious, but it's not. Make sense? Now, I'm going to teach this today. I'm not going to police this today. My job is to bring it to you. It's the Holy Spirit's job to teach you. Got it? So that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. <clears throat> the, t- the series title is The Church Just Wants My Money. The sermon title is Why Money? You ever ask, God, why don't you just leave money alone? Let's just talk about kindness and lovey-dovey and sweetness and healing and why do you got to talk about money? Well, that's exactly how darkness would like us to think about money because darkness loves for us to follow the desires of our wants. When you think about it, most people just want their way through life. I want to do this, so I'll do that. I want to, do, I want to experience that, so I'll have this. Do you all follow that? So because most people never have seen what it means to put your wanter under the Lordship of Christ and how do you get your wanter aligned with Christ, 
they, they can't figure out why their life is always in a million pieces and they never get anywhere because they've tried this and they've tried that and they've tried this and they've tried that and, they've, and nothing ever works. So we're going to take a look today at some of why God actually deals with a specific part of our walk with him with money. So once we see it this way, I believe you'll actually lean into the idea that God actually actively works with money to benefit us, not our balance sheet, but our actual life with him. Okay. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says this, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. There the desires of your heart will be also. Let me give you a practical way of seeing that. Your desires, the desires of your heart follow your treasure. Most people think their treasure follows their heart. In fact, somebody wrote a, <laughs> a, an undoctrinal song, where your heart, your heart is, there your treasure will be. You maybe have heard that song. Sound like a Christian song. It was very popular. It's doctrinally wrong. It's where your treasure is that your heart goes. What am I saying? Desire seems to be a wildly uncontrollable dynamic in our life. I want this, I want that, I want the other. And God says, in this context, I've given you a steering wheel for your desire. You decide where you put your treasure then your desires start following your treasure. So if you put your treasure in me and my kingdom, your desire will follow that into me and my kingdom. Y'all see that? Okay. So it's a very practical application why God would say it's going to be I'm going to deal with your heart with money why because your desires your heart follows money so I'm going to actually design the way we work together to interface money so that in a very practical way your heart and my intent connect your heart and my will connect and we're going to see I believe how God just says that's when the current flows all right so God wants to help us re redefine our prosperity, our understanding of prosperity. Um, prosperity, like I said a, a few minutes ago, has been in some ways misused or abused by church circles and specific kind of flavors of Christian ministry for a while. And it basically is teaching, is taking the doctrines or the teachings of Scripture as it relates to biblical finance and then arranging them for personal prestige instead of God's kingdom purpose. So many people have built big ministries or big churches manipulating people with their finance. Does that make sense? And because of that, we tend to have this res reservation about anything with finance. And you say the word prosperity and people just brace and guard. But I believe God wants us to see that differently. And so we're going to just talk innocently and talk openly about this. And I want to share some things, some thoughts that may actually help you see things from a different perspective. A lot of times when we, are, when we feel that we've been hurt or mis, misused or abused by a biblical principle or any kind of principle, we react. And when we react, we tend to go the opposite direction from the pain, but we tend to create an equally effectively destructive error on the other side. So while the prosperity message may have been harmful uh, the, and the reaction to that may have caused a person to go, then I don't want anything to do with prosperity. I'll just live in humility of lack because I won't have to deal with prosperity and being abused by it. They actually find themselves just as bound in lack in the, the appearance of humility, that's not humility at all. It looks pious, but it's not godly. It's not godly. 
I'm going to say something that may have high shock value, and I don't mean to be offensive, but I do believe God wants to dislodge some thoughts in our minds by replacing them with a different perspective. So I want to share something with you that, again, may be shocking, but let it, let it actually li- limber your thinking up a little bit to say, God, if you want me to think differently about this, then replace this with a different thought. Okay, here's what I'm saying. A person that does not want to prosper is actually thinking selfishly. A person that does not want to prosper is actually thinking selfishly. Typically, when a person is, says, I don't want to prosper, what they, feel, they finish the blank with, I just want enough to have my needs met. As long as my needs are met, I'm good. I don't, I don't want to prosper, I just want my needs met. Do you follow that? So I don't believe that they're maliciously thinking selfishly. I think they're deceived. And because they're deceived into thinking that looks humble, then they should think that way. But it's not how God wants us to actually approach his resources. God never wants us to be focused on just what I need. Because if you think about that, that's basically saying, I just want to have enough just to take care of me. You see it? Now, again, not maliciously selfish, but being deceived into thinking that all God cares about is just meeting my needs. If God God thought that way, he would not have sent his son from heaven to earth to, to save a lost and dying humanity. The scripture says God so loved the world that he gave. In other words, it was the plight of what of his creation, his love for their his love for them in their position, their condition of plight, in their helplessness of being able to do anything about it that motivated him to reach beyond him his own essence and say I'm going to intervene. Yeah. Let me say it this way. How many of you know at least one need that if you had the resources to deal with it, you would help somebody out. Raise your hand. I'm, I'm going to sit here and just ask you to think about that. You're, okay, some of you are asleep. I can just feel it. Because <laughs> every hand should have gone up. What I'm saying is, how many of you know that there's a need? It could be generic. Sexual abuse. Uh, violent crimes. Uh, homelessness. I'm asking you again, how many of you could think of at least one area that if you had the resources, you would love to make a difference and fix? Okay, you know why you feel that way? You're created in the image of God. Who has everything at his disposal. Our God is not a God of lack. Our God is not a God of self. He is love. That's why we feel that feeling. And there is a chance that maybe you couldn't respond a minute ago because you're so hurt and so, so scarred by life that maybe the idea is just a hopeless lost cause that maybe you could never actually fix or be a problem or be a solution to somebody's problem. But I want you to say you were created in the image of God. And that heart to help is by divine design. But God doesn't tease us. He's not going to create us with a heart to help and then not give us the capacity to do it. There's something standing in the way between a heart that would help and the ability to help if I could. That lack is a, response, is a, re, is a result of something God wants to shift. In other words, God doesn't want you to have just enough for you. He wants you to have so much more, access to so much more that you can actually intervene in everything around you. So do you see why from that perspective he would rather have you prosperous than in a condition of lack? Does that make sense? Doesn't that just... So on behalf of every minister that you've ever heard minister this principle of prosperity in a way that made you feel manipulated controlled, abused, I want to just say, I apologize. I repent for that. I, maybe, maybe I've said something in the past, 
But the season we're coming into is a season of miracles. God wants God to say, I want to expand your capacity to believe me for more than ever before. And there's a process I'm going to walk you through that literally expands your capacity to do that so that you are prosperous in every dimension of who you are, and I'm going to use money as a part of that. Does that make sense? So that's the spirit behind it, all right? All right, let's give the Lord a little better thanks than that. Okay, what am I saying? Here's the bottom line when it comes to the heart for God's expanding us to do this. In order for us to actually make a difference in the needs around us, there has to be some sort of increase, everyone say increase, in our capacity to manage. So first of all, if God's going to get more through me, I've got to be able to manage more. Does that make sense? It won't do any good for him to bring more to me if I just spend it on everything I want. I have to be able to learn how to manage it based on something bigger than my wanter. So he's got to increase my, my ability, my capacity to manage larger resources without them just disappearing in the cracks and crevices of desire. So I, he's, if I'm going to actually be a difference maker, there has to be an increase in my capacity to manage and, and everyone say and, my ability to release resources. So there's a couple of things that need to happen. First of all, God's got to grow my ability to manage resources. But at the same time, he's got to expand my willingness to release resources. Because there, you will see in a few minutes what happens if a person just increases and increases and increases and increases and never releases. So, kingdom finance. Kingdom finance. Number one, there, I want to talk about three primary layers to God's kingdom finance principles that actually are working in our life today. Number one, God's kingdom finance principles begin with God's tithe. Begin with God's tithe. Everyone say tithe. tithe. Now say God's tithe. God's tithe. <laughs> it's his. Yeah. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So for those of us that may be thinking, I don't raise crops for a living, that's not my job. I work at Intel and I never touch a seed. You have to look at the context that this was actually written to, which was a, an agriculturally based culture that worked with this kind of understanding. So he said... Tithe of everything you produce is mine. Does that make sense? That's the principle that transfers. So he says, all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or fruit of the tree, all the tithe is the Lord's. Everybody say, is the Lord's. Then he amplifies that. He says, it's holy to the Lord. Holy doesn't mean like uber spiritual. It means there's a specific function it has that the rest of the revenue in your hand doesn't have. He does something unique with that one that does not apply to the rest of it. It's holy. It's set apart for some reason. All right? Okay. So we'll work with that a little bit more. But let me move, let me just kind of take the needle and dig it a little deeper into the vein. Oh, we should talk about veins again. <laughs> let me drill a little bit deeper in that soil. How does that sound? Let me push a little harder on that topic. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's. So Leviticus talked about the tithe is the Lord's. But Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's. And everything in it. So the ball that it's on, that we're on, and everything in it. The cosmos is all his. Everyone say it's all his. So none of us care about that. He can have the Mississippi River, the mud in the river. He can have the oceans. We don't care about any of that stuff. It's the last part of that sentence that bugs all of us. And all who live in it, that, that's a direct hit. That's me. I belong to him. Whether I want to or not, I'm, I belong, I'm his property. Now there's some theological doctrine stuff that we got to deal with with eternity. But for right now, I'm talking about ownership. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So the tithe is his. Why? Well, everything is his. But specifically pointed to is the tithe. And then it's holy. Then I want to go back and look at Malachi chapter 3. And I know I'm, I'm using just lots of verses in a row. But I'm doing this because I intend for this particular sermon to be a resource sermon that you look back on this week and next week and the week after that and the week after that and the week after that. And I want you to know where some of these things are so you can get back to it easily. Levitic, uh, excuse me, Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 says, Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. You can just tell the way I read that I'm a church guy. That I've heard that scripture a few times. Like, well, how you're, you're under a curse, your whole nation is under a curse. Why? Because you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. And ah, la, la, la. Just the way I read it. But think about what that's actually saying. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? Like, are you kidding? Yet you're doing that. You asked, how are we doing that? Well, let me tell you how you're doing that. In tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. Because of that, you're under a curse, the whole nation. Like, well, are you cursing me because of that? Now, the scripture does not say God is cursing you. He says that a choice we're making is robbing him of something and putting us under a curse. So he's basically pointing out you're either going to live in God's kingdom or you're going to live in the kingdoms of this earth. One of them is a blessed covering. The other, the prevailing wind, is a curse. One kingdom is designed for your best redemption, the fullness of life. The other is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. One of them is a blessing to live in. The other one is a curse to live under. And God is saying that choice of what you do with the tithe is helping put you either in one system or it puts you in the other system. So he's using this phrase, you're robbing me, and we tend to get distracted by, what, you, can't, what are you, my, 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 you want my money? So... We're gonna, I think we're going to see in a minute, it's not the money he's looking for. But the issue is it deals with money. It deals with money. Tithes and offerings. You're under a curse your whole nation because you're robbing me. What are we robbing him of? It's not tithes, it's not money. It's something else. I believe the answer is found in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord search throughout the whole earth to strengthen or show himself faithful to those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Remember when we talked about the desires of your heart follow your treasure? So let's put a few pieces together and see what this picture emerges. He says, if you don't return the tithe that belongs to me, like I say to return it, you're robbing me of something. You're putting yourself under a curse, but you're robbing me of something. What is that? I'm looking throughout the whole earth looking to show myself faithful to somebody whose heart is fully committed to me, whose heart is fully my way and in my hands. Do you all see that? So when we actually res- return the Lord's tithe to his storehouse, like he says, our desire starts to follow that, which means our heart follows that treasure into his hands and into his kingdom. Does that make sense? So our hearts are, mo- are more fully committed to him. Do you all follow that? Then that gives him the ability to do something that he wants to do, but can't do unless our hearts are fully committed to him. Well, I love the Lord. The Lord knows my heart. Yes, he does. You don't, but he does. Well, how dare you? I didn't dare that. The Lord said that. How do we know what's in our heart? It comes out of our mouth and by our choices. That's what, your, that's what your heart's showing. Out of the abundance of that heart, the mouth speaks. And the choices we make are affected by our heart. That's how we can see what's in our heart. So what are we choosing to do with our finance? Are we returning God? Oh, yeah, I'm going too, too many sermons all at once, too many sermons all at once. Back to the Lord saying, you're robbing me of something. It isn't the money. It's his capacity. It's his ability to do something he wants to do that only our heart in his hands gives him the ability to do. 
So he says, here's how to fix it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Then he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to restore it. And I always listen to that by saying, if I'll just tithe and if I'll just bring my offering to the house of God, he'll bless me and I'll get jets. And I'll have big boats in a big house. Which he could care less about if I want a jet. Think and really look at what he's saying. That scripture says, return the whole tithe to the storehouse. Then he says, test me in this and see if I will not what? Throw open the floodgates. Okay, first thing we'll talk about is floodgates. Apparently, for some people, the floodgates are not open. The floodgates of heaven that apparently the blessings are coming through, those floodgates are not open. Well, I thought you loved me, God. If you really loved me, you'd open those floodgates. Then I'd get everything I want. He's like, no, I love you so much, I'm not going to open the floodgates because your heart's not in my hand. If I open those floodgates and pour out that kind of blessing, you'd be like everybody that wins a lottery who's not ready for it. Your life would explode in destruction. Why? You'd consume it on your own desires. When really what I'm trying to do, remember this illustration? I'm trying to actually pour through you so much that you can address this and you can fix that and you can train this and you can help that. So that everything that you see that is a need, you can be a resource to. What if we got to the place as individuals, as a church family, what if we got to the place as people that whatever need showed up, we would both have the spiritual wisdom and the resources to deal with it. Instead of going, well, I'll pray for you, brother. Which is a poverty mindset of going, well, nobody can do anything about it, but we can at least say a prayer. Can't help you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. I can't believe I just did that. God doesn't want us to put in a good word. He wants us to be a resource. A spiritual font of wisdom and knowledge, the flowing of his kingdom through us and the resources it takes to deal with it. All of it, not just money, all of it. Y'all see that? God wants to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there's not room to store it. Which means I, didn't, I don't want to bless you for you. I don't mind you being blessed. I don't mind you having the experience of it. But I want to bless you so much you can't store it. Which means I'm trying to get the blessing through you. You see it? That's what we're robbing him of. Remember, God can do anything. How many of you realize that he's the best evangelist heaven has? Could God tell the story better than you can? Could God manifest in the flesh and convince everybody with signs and wonders that he is God and tell them the Romans road and they'd be forced to bow their knee and acknowledge? Probably so, although they didn't when Jesus came. But I'm just saying that makes a pretty good case. You understand what I mean? He can do anything. You know what he chose to do? Use us. Everything he wants to do on the planet. We, when Jesus came, he was God incarnate. He was God in flesh. Now who's his flesh? We are. Which means he fully intends to use us just like he used Jesus. You're like, man, that's a, whole, that's a whole lot tied to tithing. I realize that. But that's the foundation because it deals with the lordship issue. I belong to you. Everything in my hands belong to you. Everything that comes into my hands, the increase is already yours. And there's a part of that that you call the tithe, you said is holy. And there's something specifically tied to that that I need to know what to do with. Why? I want my heart, I want my heart and my life in your hands. Why? Because I want you to be able to do what you want to do through me. Not because I want more. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
People have a lot of well intentions but wrong thoughts about what to do with the tithe. God says, it's already pre-directed, bring it to the storehouse. That's where I'm telling you to bring it. A lot of people say, I want to give it to the poor. I want to do this ministry with it. I give it to missions. I want to do this and that and the other. Listen, if you take God's tithe and give it to the poor, you think you're generous. But you're not generous. You stole God's money and put it where someplace he didn't say put it. Pastor Dave, I'm just trying to help the poor. You want to help the poor? Do you really want to help the poor? Tithe, like God said. Grow in the rest of it. And let him pour billions of dollars through you. Then you can help the poor. Does that make sense? But if you just take his money and put it where he did said don't do it, you feel generous, but you're not. It's like the government who takes your dollars through taxes and puts it to places you don't want. They feel generous. They're not. They took your money and did what they wanted to with it. It's not generous until it's my money. Does that make sense? You're like, should you have said that about the government? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what they're doing. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just trying to actually be real. Giving isn't generosity until it comes from what's in my hands to manage. So kingdom finance, uh, God's kingdom finance principles begin with his tithe. Number two, God's kingdom finance principles build as we learn how to let the money God puts into our management make more money. What do we say? A lot of people have a certain lifestyle built on a combination of 1099, W-2s, jobs. Nothing wrong with that. Scripture says, let him that stole steal no more that he may have something in his hands to, he may work to have something in his hands to give. God wants us to work. Everybody understand? God doesn't want you to be, you're not a blessing by being a freeloader. Well, I just want to be a source of blessing. So you give to me and God will bless you. So you can, I'll just be that source. No, you're being a freeloader. No blessing in that. But God doesn't just want you to trade time for money. He says, I'm going to teach you how to handle multiples so that your money makes money. Practically speaking, I believe every household, every household ought to have multiple streams of income. Why? Because that is giving God the ability to have the resource he puts in your hand actually multiply while you're, while you're asleep. Why? You have more to work with. Where is that in Scripture? How about the money parables that Jesus taught with? If you look about the, the parables of the talent, the parables of the mina, every one of those that was acceptable to the Lord are 100% return on investment. Always multiples. Always multiples. Always multiples. God's kingdom is a kingdom of increase. I don't know if you've ever connected the dots on this. It's getting awfully quiet. I'm either losing you to sleep or you're getting bored or something. <laughs> don't, don't stop. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the, the initial commission to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. In other words, take what I set up in this garden and put dominion that I've given you capable, uh, you the ability to do, exercise dominion in increasing ways until the whole earth is filled with my dominion. Everything about God's kingdom is multiple, it's multiply. Everything about it. But where we get stuck on it and the, where we get tripped up on it is we tend to think of it as, well, if I'm, if I'm rich, then I'll be tempted to spend it on my behalf. So let me, let me add a qualifier, a clarifier. In God's kingdom, increase is for impact, not just for personal indulgence. In other words, once we realize the increase is not for us to consume, it's for us to make a difference with, 
that issue begins to be less and less and less of a trip up. Does that make sense? God called us to be people of resource, not so that we'll be tempted to consume it, but we'll be people of impact, people that make a difference. I want you to keep this image in your mind. Just enough for my needs, and I'm happy. Is well intended, but it misses the mark of God's heart. God actually needs you to be far more prosperous than that so that your needs are met, but the blessings flow through you to make a difference somewhere else. If all we're concerned about is just us, then we're not being minded like God was minded. It's equally wrong to say, I want more so I can have more. That's equally wrong. But I want to be prosperous so I can make an impact is biblically aligned. Does that make sense? So the issue is not shying away from prosperity. The issue is line your prosperity understanding up with God's word. What's the purpose for it? Why? So our, our heart will lean into it and say, okay, God, you can go to work on me. You can go to work on me. Finally, God's kingdom finance principles are demonstrated by divine guidance in our purchases. God's kingdom finance principles are demonstrated by divine guidance in our purchases. What does that mean? There's something about the way when we follow God in every part of our life, including what we purchase and how we live, we say, God, is this what you would have me to have? Is this what you'd have me to have? God made this decision to make this house purchase or this car purchase or this vacation purchase or this what restaurant purchase or new pair of shoes purchase or a purse or whatever, Amazon purchase. It's, ooh. Well, there it is. Found it. It's everybody's secret addiction. It's like some people are addicted to crack. And for, some, for most people, Amazon is the crack. That's where all the money goes. There's a, we have CR every Monday for crack addicts and Amazon addicts and food addicts and gambling addicts and just about any other dysfunction you can think of. Let me, let me finish this thought. You guys still okay? Okay, here we go. God releases his blessings in our lives in part to affirm his identity as God and our identity in him. Listen carefully to Malachi chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, New Living Translation. Your crops will be abundant and I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they're ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then, everybody say then. Then all nations will call you blessed for your land will be as such a delight says the Lord of heaven's armies okay let's go through this backwards there'll be a moment that your land is so blessed is so is such a delight because you are so blessed that everybody has to look at you and say you're blessed you see it when people look at you and say you're blessed they're automatically acknowledging your blesser So the choice to live a prosperous life gives, God's, uh, give God, gives God the position of being able to demonstrate his blessing, which equivalates to him being the blessor, which actually identifies his identity in your journey. Does that make sense? It also identifies that you're his because you're living in the flow of who he is. So... Kingdom finance principles are also de demonstrated by divine guidance in our purchases. The way we actually spend money begins to demonstrate who he is as he blesses our life to other people who look to us. Y'all follow that? Okay. Now, it's important to always remember that we worship the blesser, not the blessing. That's who we're aligning with. 
we can never get to the spot where we think we're tricking God. We, don't, we can't prostitute God for prosperity. We don't use God that way. We yield to him our life so his prosperity moving through us can benefit others. That's probably the whole sermon in one sentence. I probably just said, <laughs> should have said that. That's why Matthew 6.33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and, he, and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. So, three things. Three things that, that frame the foundation of this. God's kingdom finance principles begins with his, everyone say tithe. They build, on, they build as we learn how to let them how to let the money God puts in our management make more money. And they are demonstrated by divine guidance and purchases. So over the next few weeks, we're going to actually take this apart and very practically look at how do we do that. In the meantime, today, I wanted to provide you a, the basic biblical palette that we're going to be drawing from next week and the following week and then the season after that for a little while. Does that make sense? All right, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you're faithful to your word. God, as we lean into this season and into this particular aspect of our journey, where you're challenging us to be willing to expand, part of it includes the finances that you work with us with. Part of it includes our time, making space for you. Part of it's using the talents you've given us for your kingdom. You're saying, make room for me. Reapportion real, real parts of your life for what I want to do in you. Because in doing so, it gives me the ability to move through you in bigger ways. You were created for that. Well, that's what we hear you say today. So thank you for the practical guidance of that. Lord, I just give you thanks because as you lead us and we follow you, you're going to demonstrate the power of your kingdom moving through our lives in ways that blow our mind. And we want you to know in advance we're grateful for it. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to say to those of you that are in this room or watching the playback, there's some of you that need to say yes to the Lordship of Jesus and give your life to him. We start by acknowledging who he is and what he's done. He's God who came to earth and lived a sinless life, died on Calvary's cross to pay the penalty of our sin, give us the ability to yield our lives back in relationship with him and live forever in eternity with him. Some of you need to do that today. And if that's you, you already know in your heart that that's you. I'm going to ask that you would say, yes, that's me in your heart. Then join me and everybody else as we say this biblical prayer of repentance. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me enough to tell me the truth in your Bible. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to die on Calvary's cross to pay for every sin of my life. I ask you to cleanse me, to wash me, to renew me, completely restore me. Come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, I need your power and your strength to live for Jesus the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Everybody said, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise today. Thank you, Lord. If you made that decision to start a relationship with Jesus today, congratulations. We would love to connect with you so that this first step won't be your last step. Click the next step link in the description below. Our team would love to connect with you, pray with you, and put tools in your hand to help you make the most of your decision today. For those of you that worship with us regularly and are looking for a way to worship God through giving, click the giving link in the description below or download the Secure Give app. Thank you so much for watching today. We'd love to see you in person Sundays at 9 or 11 at our Gilbert campus. Have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday.